All right, folks, let's move on to our next lecture in this course. And we're going to cover charge carrier dynamics. And when I say dynamics, meaning things that are changing, um, hence the term. And we'll cover four general topics today, generation, recombination, diffusion, and drift. Um, all four of these concepts are absolutely critically important in this course. So it, it, it's important that if you have any questions whatsoever, you uh, stop me now at this point. Uh, the photo of the day is... Um, to get our minds going here a little bit, is a imaging chip inside a camera. And we'll talk about some of the basic concepts in terms of how this works, particularly in terms of using light to cause optical generation of carriers such as electrons and holes, and then you read them out using things like drift and diffusion to, to get current flow to get the carriers out and basically form an image um, that's recorded in the circuitry of the phone. We won't be able to cover that today, but I just wanted to show you an application where carrier generation, diffusion, and drift are critically important. So, a bit of review from last time, just to uh, refresh our memory. We had talked about carrier concentrations being calculated as the density of states, how many states do you have available, times the Fermi distribution, what's the probability of filling them, and then, of course, we got our carrier populations of electrons in the conduction band and holes in the balance band. And we had also talked about uh, doping a material. So in this case, the material is n-type or doped with something like phosphorus. That increases the number of electrons and therefore decreases the number of holes because they are finding more electrons to recombine with. So it kills off that population. And mathematically, that also has to cause our Fermi level distribution to shift up and so therefore our Fermi level, which is the 50% chance, has to be closer to where there are more electrons um, here in the conduction band. And then we had the same thing for p-type material. We do it with p-type, more holes, which then kills off more electrons than what we started with, and our Fermi level shifts in the opposite direction. We also looked at uh, doping levels from a material standpoint, and so when we had a block of p-type material here, the positive uh, symbols shown here are the holes and the circled things here are the boron atoms that are doped. The positive things can move, those are the holes they can move freely being an absence of an electron that can be traded back and forth from silicon atom to silicon atom and the boron atoms are negatively charged because they created a hole by taking an electron from silicon and they are stuck in place and they can't move. We talked about calculating the carrier concentration the number of holes is equal to the number of boron atoms because typically your doping levels are orders and orders of magnitude greater than the thermally generated concentrations. So you can just make the approximation that number of holes equals number of boron atoms. And we said, of course, that as number of holes goes up due to doping, then conversely the number of electrons goes down. And we can calculate that by putting the number of electrons and holes, the product of the two, equal to the intrinsic carrier concentration squared. We did something similar um, for electrons as well. This is n-type material. This is the phosphorus atoms. They are positively charged. They can't move. The electrons can move. And we have the same relationship for calculating as one concentration goes up, the other goes down. And of course, the number of electrons is equal to the number of phosphorus atoms. Okay, so now um, let's go into something new, uh, or it's a little bit new, but let's go into a little bit more detail than we had previously. So, let's assume that we have undoped silicon, meaning that it is all intrinsic carriers. Now, at 300 K, some of the electrons, again, are bound to the silicon. In fact, actually, most of the electrons at room temperature are bound to the silicon, but, which is the valence band, right? That's why we call it the valence band and some of them get enough energy to reach the conduction band where they can become freely conducting. So here's a, an electron was down here in the valence band, it comes up here, forms an electron, and then that creates a hole down in the valence band here, creating an electron-hole pair. Both the electron and the hole are mobile. Now, at 300 K, you create these electrons and holes, and they don't sit around, they actually move back and forth. So you, you create one, it moves around, you create a hole, it moves around. And eventually, they find each other again. Not necessarily the same two, but any two could refine each other, line up like these two here, and then the electron recombines and goes back down into the valence band. And what happens is you lose an electron, and you also lose the hole. So they both annihilate each other. 
What this does is as this happens, remember this electron had higher energy here and it went back down here. So it gives up its energy as heat to the silicon. And so the thermal generation of carriers goes back into the heat which thermally generated it in the first place. So what we have is we have two competing processes, generation and recombination, which balance out. And that balance results in the n naught and the p naught concentrations we have. Again, remembering, the more carriers we generate thermally, they will find each other faster and recombine faster. So if I have a ton of carriers, it's going to be easier for them to see each other, right? Because they're at higher density. Also important, if I'm generating more thermally, I increase the temperature to increase the thermal generation, when I generate them, they're also able to move faster. And so when they move faster, they're also able to find each other faster. So this also increases the rate at which they recombine. So both having a higher density of, density of them, higher concentration, and allowing them to move around faster and find each other, both cause the recombination to increase. Of course, the net effect is still a general increase in the number of intrinsic carriers. So even though you increase the thermal generation rate, you get more electrons and holes, and the recombination rate increases, the general balance is that the total concentration is greater than it was at lower temperature. And we see that with the Fermi distribution. So here's our Fermi distribution, 100% probability. We're plotting energy in this direction now. And at 0K, you can see you get the Fermi distribution you expect. As you go to higher temperatures, the Fermi distribution spreads out more and more. And on the previous slide, you'll see that increases the carrier populations as it overlaps with the density of states. So, the question is, what about doping? How does doping affect our recombination? Well, remember, first off, let's talk about how doping is affected by temperature. And then we'll talk about how it affects recombination. So, we typically only choose dopants like boron, phosphor, phosphorus, and arsenic that completely ionize at 300K. When I say it completely ionizes at 300 K, that means every dopant atom you put in the silicon will do its thing. It'll generate an electron or hole or whatever it's supposed to do. And it will not take it back. And so it just sits there, generates its carrier, and it stays in that state of being ionized. Now, if we look at this plot here, here's a plot here of carrier concentration. So this is increasing carrier concentration in this direction versus 1 over temperature in this direction means increasing temperature this way, increasing carrier concentration. So increasing temperature, increasing carrier concentration. So the first thing you have in terms of your carrier concentration is this is ionization of the dopant atoms. In this case, it would be phosphorus. And when you get to about minus 280 degrees Fahrenheit, at that point, all the phosphorus does its job and creates electrons. So then you have this wide area of temperatures over which the electron concentration stays nice and constant. And that's what you want for a semiconductor. You know, if you have a computer chip, you know it gets hot while it's running. So the last thing you want is the dopant levels fluctuating back and forth because then the device behaviors inside the chip could change drastically in terms of their conductivity. So this is a good thing, okay? And in this case, the number of the doping concentration is 10 to the 15th. Now, what happens at some point, though, is that if you keep increasing your temperature, at some point the thermally generated electrons increases to the point where it takes over. So here is my thermally generated carrier concentration. And you could see at some point higher temperatures, it overtakes the doped level and you get what we call intrinsic material again, meaning that this was extrinsic or n-type. So there were many more electrons than holes. And then if the thermal generation becomes strong, you generate so many electron and holes, electrons and holes, orders of magnitude greater than the dope level, that it looks like intrinsic material where the number of electrons and holes are equal. And so it's good to understand this, this, this temperature scale in terms of the doping levels. So here's a question I have for you. How would you make a simple current voltage temperature sensor? let's say you could use for, you know, measuring the temperature in your home. Would you use doped silicon or undoped silicon or a metal? Well, if you were smart, you would use undoped silicon because if you have doped silicon, you can see the conductivity of the slab of silicon doesn't change much with temperature, right, over, over room temperature, which is right around here. 
And so what you do is you put wires across your block of silicon, and you'd measure the current through it as you apply a voltage. And if it's undoped silicon, then you get an exponential change of conductivity with temperature. So you get a huge change in the amount of current flow through this little measurement device with temperature. So that'd be one way you could use this, what we've learned here, to make a, uh, a practical device. So let's ask, ask the next question, which we're, we were building up to. Does doping affect recombination? And the answer is yes, but the key point is it only has to do with electrons and holes finding each other. It has nothing to do with re dopants recapturing their carriers. Remember, once you get above, you know, minus 280 degrees Fahrenheit, at that point, all the dopant atoms do their thing, right? They basically all ionize, and that means that they're not going to take their carriers back. So if I have phosphorus atoms creating electrons, those electrons are created, and they will not go back to the phosphorus atoms. They will not recombine with the phosphorus atoms. And so let's look at the implications of that. Well, let's look at something called generation and recombination rates here, okay? And so when... We are at thermal equilibrium, so we've let this sit on the table for a while. The generation rate is equal to the recombination rate, meaning that the rate at which I generate carriers is equal to the rate at which I re they recombine, which we've said before. And you can calculate these as 1 over cubic centimeter, 1 over seconds. So how much of the concentration is either being generated or recombined per unit time. Now. Here's the key point we wanted to sh I wanted to show you here, and in terms of how, how um, increased carrier concentrations can affect recombination. The recombination rate is equal to the recombination coefficient times n naught p naught, or equal to recombination co coefficient times n i squared. And so you can see already that as you increase the number of carriers, since this is a constant the recombination rate will go up. And we said that makes sense, right? If there's more carriers, they can find each other more easily and recombine. And I want you to note that the recombination factor is just based on what mechanism drives the recombination. We'll talk more about that later, but there's many mechanisms that can help these things recombine once they find each other, okay? So let's keep moving along here. The generation and recombination are rates. So if I have a rate, it's basically, you know, a rate is 1 over units of seconds, right? That's a rate. So how much of, how much of x are you doing per unit second? That's a rate. Well, if I have a rate, then there also must be a lifetime or time over which the carriers live before they die. And obviously, they don't all disappear at the exact same time right? They have to find each other. So what we get is a statistical average, average. Some of them find each other quickly, some of them take longer time, okay? And so you can see in the diagram here, if these were all thermally generated very quickly, these ones would find each other quickly and recombine, whereas these ones would have to move around a little bit to find each other and would take longer time. But what we would, what we would do is we would get a statistical average that we would represent as the lifetime. And so look what we have here. The lifetime we have here for the electrons and the lifetime for the holes is equal. And it's equal to 1 over the recombination factor and the carrier concentrations. So if either of these goes up, the lifetime goes down. And that makes sense because as either other of these things go up, their ease of finding each other increases because it's a higher concentration, and so the lifetime should go down. The key thing to note is that this equation is valid for both doped and undoped cases. It's pretty interesting. And so if I have a doped case where I have tons of electrons and very few holes, you're like, well, why is the lifetime the same? The reason why the lifetimes are the same is because even though I have tons of electrons for n-type material and very few holes, the only thing I care about are the thermally generated carriers. And the thermally generated carriers are equal, right? Those, every time you create an electron, you create a hole. And those are the only ones that recombine. The doped ones don't recombine. So because of that, the lifetimes are always equal. Again, when you thermally generate carriers, every time you create an electron, you create a hole. So the carrier concentrations of electrons and holes are equal for the thermally generated ones. And if those are the only ones that can recombine, then their lifetimes must be equal.
let's look at an example here and see how this plays out practically. So let's assume we have gallium arsenide and it is doped p-type to the level of 10 to the 15th per cubic centimeter. And the intrinsic carrier concentration for gallium arsenide is 10 to the 6th per cc at 300 K. These are the thermally generated ones, right? We can therefore calculate the minority carrier electrons as Ni squared over P naught and find that it's only 10 to the minus 3 per cc. So a huge difference between the number of electrons and holes. So let's look at the lifetimes and how this plays out in an actual slab of material in terms of the concentrations changing. So let's assume that at t equals 0, we create 10 to the 14th electron hole pairs. So don't worry about how we do this, but let's just say somehow we inject in this material um, in these electron hole pairs, we create them. And then we'll look again to see if the electron and hole lifetimes will be equal. Well, of course, they will be equal, but here's the key thing. Remember, the doped holes don't recombine, so only the thermally generated electrons and holes are the ones that recombine. And so look at the plot here. This is the plot of the carrier concentration in this slab of p-type doped gallium arsenide, increasing carrier concentration. And this is plotted here versus time. And so we generated, we said at t equals 0, we generated 10 to the 14th electron hole pairs. And so here's the number of electrons we start with, 10 to the 14th, because the dope level was really, I mean, the level that was left after we increased the doping, the thermally generated, was only down to 10 to the minus 3. So it's way, way, way down here. And so we start out at t equals 0 right here with 10 to the 14th electrons. And the concentration falls off exponentially. This is the log scale, okay? And so as I go this on the semi-log plot here, I should see a straight line because it's falling off the concentration. It's falling off exponentially with time. And so the key thing here is that my electron population changes a ton over time, orders of magnitude with only tens of nanoseconds. Now let's look at the doped level and how that changed here. So we doped this p-type to 10 to the 15th. So 10 to the 15th, we have this background concentration of 10 to the 15th. And then we added 10 to the 14th which is a tiny bit here. So we add 10 to the 14th, the, pot, the concentration goes up a little bit, and you can see this curve where this is where it's also exponentially decreasing. But the overall change is tiny because we're only changing 10 to the 14th on top of a huge 10 to the 15th population. And so effectively, you could say that your whole concentration really didn't change versus time. And so this helps you visualize what matters in terms of recombination and how carrier concentrations change. One of the things that you're going to see in this class over and over again is that the most important carriers in devices is the minority carriers. So the minority carriers are the ones that change the most, and we'll see that for PN junctions, they dominate the behavior, Okay, PN junctions being diodes. Again, the carrier decrease decreases exponentially with time. If you want to look at this delta n here, this function, it's the delta n you started with, which is 10 to the 14th. So you put 10 to the 14th out far, up front for um, the concentration. And then you see an exponential decrease of the, of, of the concentration with time, where here is time t, and this is the lifetime tau sub n. And so you put in the lifetime tau sub n. And we can look up the lifetime tau sub n in data tables. So if you want to know, well, how fast is for a given concentration, does the electrons, do the electrons recombine? You looked it up in a data table and you find that it's about 10 nanoseconds is the lifetime. And so you can see that, you know, by 10 nanoseconds, you've already gone down almost a full order of magnitude. So it is close to the statistical average you would expect. Again, there are tables to get the lifetime data. And so here you have a plot of lifetime so this is increasing lifetime or decreasing lifetime in this direction versus increasing dopant levels. So we're looking at lifetime of holes on this axis versus electron, electron concentration on this axis. And as you would expect, as you increase the number of electrons, the lifetime, which is this plot, goes down. Because as you have more electrons, the holes more quickly find an electron to recombine with,
and their lifetime goes down. And of course, that was predicted by this equation as well. This plot also has a new term here called diffusion length. And because it's length, the units are of length. The units are centimeters. Okay. And here we're keeping track of the diffusion length of the holes. So what do you think this is? Well, what diffusion length is, it gives us a statistical representation of after you thermally generate a hole, how much can it move around before it is, an electron comes down and recombines with it. And so if you look at whole lifetime decreases, if, I'm sorry, this is the lifetime here. If the lifetime is decreasing, then the average length it can move by diffusing around after it's created should also decrease as you increase doping levels. So again, you increase doping levels, a hole is generated. So we'll just draw it here. So I basically create an electron, I create a hole, okay? And let's say that the hole is able to move, move around a little bit. The maximum distance it can go, or the statistical average it goes, is diffusion length before it finds another electron which recombines and kills it. And so if I increase the doping levels and I've got tons of electrons here, let's say this is heavily n-type doped, tons of electrons, then you would say the hole only goes this far before it finds an electron to recombine with. And so the diffusion length would decrease as you increase doping levels. So let's move on to back, let's move back to generation. So besides temperature and doping, are there other ways to increase the carriers? Well, one way you could increase the carrier concentrations besides doping and besides using thermal generation is you could electrically inject them. And we will start talking about that next week when we have PN junctions or diodes. That's exactly how you get carriers across a PN junction is you electrically inject them to the other side. Another way we could do this is you could also bring in photons of light with energy greater than the band gap energy here. So you may not have finished electromagnetic fields yet at this point, so let me describe a little bit more what a photon is and how this process works. And so a photon is an elementary particle. We'll look more about that on the next, next, uh, next slide. But it's a particle of light, and it could come into a semiconductor system, and if the energy of the photon is greater than the band gap energy, the distance between the valence and the conduction band, that photon can transfer its energy to an electron down in the valence band. That electron gains the energy from the photon. The photon disappears. It's kicked up into the conduction band. At that point, if the photon energy was just enough to, to generate this, the electron could sit right here. If the photon energy was greater than the band gap, where it kicked an electron way up here, that electron then has more energy than it needs to be to sit in the conduction band, so then it relaxes back down to the conduction band edge. And as it does that, I'm going from higher energy to lower energy, right? And so what it's doing here is it's giving off its energy as heat, which is just phonons. Phonons are basically little vibrations of the silicon atoms. So when the silicon gets hot because you're increasing it, increase its energy or heat, all it is is the atoms are vibrating back and forth more. And so that's what it gives it up to. Let's look at uh, a photon in a little bit more detail in terms of how, we, how it moves and what the energy, uh, how the energy can be calculated. And so a photon is really just an electromagnetic energy disturbance. So you put a little of energy in the right way and you can create an electromagnetic disturbance which travels forward versus time as a wave. And there are two components to the wave. There is a sinusoidal wave component that is comprised of electric field and there is a magnetic field which is also propagating forward. When you do an EM fields and you look at uh, um, uh, some of the fundamental laws, you'll see that if you have a time varying electric field, that creates magnetic field. Just kind of like when you have current through a wire. If you have electric current through a wire, it generates a magnetic field around it. Same thing applies here. We've got electric field that generates magnetic field. And what you find is that the electric field moves and then also creates magnetic field and these both self-sustain each other and keep this thing propagating forward. So once you have this thing it has a certain wavelength where you you know from from peak to peak or trough to trough or zero point to zero point and so the wavelength you measure in meters the speed of light is measured in meters per second and you can then calculate the frequency in Hertz up here and so what you have up here 
is you have various frequencies of light shown at the top scale here. How you calculate the energy for a photon in terms of electron volts is you basically take hc over lambda, okay? You take Planck's constant, speed of light, divided by the wavelength in meters. And a simple way to remember this is if you multiply hc times each other and you use units of lambda in nanometers, then the energy of a photon is equal to 1240 divided by lambda in nanometers. And so, for example, take a photon which is a little bit greater than 600 nanometers, so out in the red, you know, around 620 nanometers or so. Well, 1240 divided by 620 would be 2, right? And so the energy of that photon is 2 electron volts. As we go to shorter wavelengths in the visible spectrum, shorter and shorter wavelengths, you go to the green, to the blue, to the ultraviolet, and you can see the energy of the photons also increases. I've listed some semiconductors here in terms of their band gap energy. So silicon's way out here in the infrared. Here's aluminum, gallium, indium, phosphide, which is in the, in the red. Indium, gallium, nitride in the green. Indium, aluminum, gallium, nitride in the blue. And uh, even more aluminum in there gets you out into the violet, which is the technology which is used in DVD Blu-rays. And it's important to remember that this whole spectrum here, this is the visible spectrum, it is only a tiny, tiny portion of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Just a tiny sliver. And so let's look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum and let me ask you a question. So why is it that people tell you that ultraviolet light, x-ray, and gamma rays are all harmful for you, but you can take something like a cell phone, which is in the microwave range here, put it right up next to your head as you're talking with it, and no one ever says there's any issues with that in terms of harming you. Why is that? Well, it turns out that, and this is the same reason why you want to basically wear sunscreen in the summer, is that as you go to shorter wavelengths, so I'm going to shorter wavelengths, eventually you get to a point here when you start to go out into the ultraviolet, ultraviolet, and even more so in the X-ray and gamma ray, where the energy of the photons gets greater than three to five electron volts. It just so happens that the energy that holds your DNA together is typically around, you know, four or so, five, six electron volts. And when you start getting photons in the three to six range, they have enough energy where that light can go into your DNA and change it. And what happens when you change your DNA is that you could create a new type of cell that is harmful. And that's what, how essentially you get cancer, is the DNA, you know, something like that, a, light, uh, a photon of light of high energy can come in there, rearrange your DNA, program it so that the cell just basic, cells basically reproduce extremely rapidly and uncontrollably, and that's basically how you have the onset of cancer. So the reason why we don't care about microwaves is, yeah, sure, maybe you, can, you have a high amount of power in the transmitter on your cell phone, but it doesn't matter. The energy of the photons here, look at this, so look at, we're changing the frequency by orders of magnitude. And so you have millions of times less energy than you need to rearrange your DNA. And so a single photon in the microwave simply does not have enough energy to go in there and say, change the biology of your cells. And so that's why those are considered safe. And so I'll also mention that's the same reason why you wear sunscreen in the, uh, in the summer because when you get down to the UV, again, you've got enough energy DNA. So, if it were not for the fact that photons of light can come into silicon and optically generate electron hole pairs, silicon would look like glass, okay? But silicon is dark, and the reason why is that its band gap energy is such that it absorbs all wavelengths in the visible spectrum. If you have a wider band gap semiconductor like aluminum oxide, which is also essentially sapphire, its band gap is wide enough that photons in the visible spectrum don't have enough energy to be absorbed and they go right through it. So it looks optically clear. So let's calculate what wavelengths of light silicon will absorb. Well, again, we can use the energy of the photon is equal to 1240 divided by the wavelength of the photon in nanometers. We know that silicon has a band gap energy of 1.12 eV, so the energy of the photon has to be greater than that to be absorbed. If you don't have enough energy to kick the electron from the valence band to the conduction band, 
it won't make it there, so it won't, the photon won't be absorbed, it'll just go right through it. So therefore this says if you do the calculation, you put this on this side, and then you back calculate wavelength, you'll find that the, energy, the wavelengths of photons have to be less than 1.1 microns in wavelength in order to be absorbed. Anything longer than 1.1 microns will pass right through it. In fact, if I took night vision goggles, like you use for hunting or military purposes, and they're out in the infrared, let's say some of them could be out in the infrared around 1.5 microns, if I held a silicon wafer up in front of me, you would be able to see right through it, it would look like glass, because out in the infrared, the wavelengths of light don't have enough energy to be absorbed. Here's a question. What if the energy of the photon is twice the band gap energy? So let's say I bring in a photon that's got, you know, 2.4 or 3 electron volts and it hits silicon. Well, even if you have twice the energy, you still only get one electron hole pair. What happens is you kick that electron way up into the conduction band above it, but it just relaxes back down, giving up heat, and you only get one electron hole pairs typically. And so all you do is basically just generate excess heat. Let's do a sample calculation. Let's hit silicon with 10 to the 13th photons of green light, green light having an energy of 2.2 eV, or 550 nanometers in wavelength, and we're hitting this many photons every one microsecond, which is 10 to the 13th divided by 10 to the minus 6, which gives us 10 to the 19th per second. And ask ourselves, how much power is that? A lot or a little? Well, let's do the calculation. So if we want power in terms of watts, the first things we need is joules, so we can get joules per second. So the joules will basically get from electron volts by multiplying the charge of an electron times a volt. And so if 2.2 electron volts, 2.2 electron volts, I have the charge of the electron, the E here, is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs, and the volt is 2.2, that's what I had out front. Multiply these together, coulomb times volt, I get joules. The next thing I want to do is divide this by the time, okay, and how many I have coming in. And so I have 10 to the 13th coming in, every one microsecond, I multiply this by the number of joules, then I get joules per second, and I do my calculation, and I get 3.5 picowatts, which is a tiny amount. So even if I have 10 to the 19th photons per second, that's only a tiny amount of power. So if you have a one watt LED light bulb, you have an enormous number of photons streaming out of that. So as the, as the silicon is is is, is being irradiated with this light and being absorbed. The energy is twice the band gap, right? This is about twice the band gap of silicon. And so 1.7 picowatt becomes heat, right? Because you have an electron which is kicked up way from the valence band, way up here, and then it relaxes down to the conduction band and it basically gives off heat as it goes and causes vibrations in the silicon. Once it gets to the, to, the, uh, to the conduction band, it can move around till it finds a hole. It doesn't have to be the same hole that was generated with it. They can recombine, and that also gives off heat or causes vibrations of the silicon atom. And so basically, over time, as you have light hitting a, hitting a chunk of silicon, essentially, all the energy turns into heat. And that makes sense. There's nothing revolutionary about that. Basically, if I took a silicon wafer and I put it out in the sun, you would imagine that it absorbs the sun's energy and it gets hot over time. And so that's all I'm showing with this simple calculation here. Now, more, more interesting is, say, is to calculate, well, how many excess carriers do I get? So how do you calculate that? If you have all these photons coming in, how do I calculate this? Well, how you calculate that is use a formula, which basically is the excess I create in terms of cubic centimeter of electrons is equal to the excess of holes. So right, if I'm, if I'm generating these thermally, number of excess electrons equals the number of holes. If I'm generating these optically, every time a photon is absorbed, you create an electron, but you also create a hole. So the number of excess electrons equals number of holes. That is equal to the optical generation rate times the lifetime. And remember, the lifetime for electrons and holes is equal, so I could say it's optical generation rate times lifetime of holes, or optical generation rate times lifetime of electrons. And basically this is, say, how fast are you creating them, how fast are they going away, 
and if you take these two together, that gives you the excess you have. And the units work out, if your optical generation rate is 1 over cc per, per second, then you multiply this times seconds, the second goes away, and you're left with just concentration, which is 1 over cc. Now, let's talk about optical recombination. Semiconductors can absorb photons greater than or equal to the band gap energy. We said that, right? So a photon comes in, it's got energy greater than the band gap. Kick an electron up here, you create a hole. If it's more energy than the band gap, that electron will come down to the conduction band to its lowest energy state and create a little bit of heat. And over time, they move around. You can have an electron hole find each other and then recombine, which also goes back in heat. But the question is, could they recombine and create a photon? Reverse the process. Photon comes in, creates an electron hole pair. They recombine. Could it kick a photon out that then propagates away? Well, it can do this only if it is a direct band gap material. And so what's a direct band gap material? Well, what we have here is we have the energy scale here. Here's my band gap here versus K space, which is related to carrier momentum. If it's a direct band gap material, as I plot my energy band gap versus K space here, I will find that my minimum here and my minimum for the conduction band and maximum for the balance band line up perfectly. And when I have electrons and holes here, they will recombine and it will generate a photon that comes out of this each and every time most likely. Now, don't worry too much about K-space because it's beyond this course. This is something you learn in semiconductor physics. So when wouldn't, wouldn't this work? Well, if you have an indirect band gap material, then you can see your conduction band minima and the valence band maxima here in K-space aren't aligned. So what this means is if I have an electron over here and a hole over here, and this is momentum, what this means is that the electron over here has to change momentum to have the same momentum as the hole, so they could recombine and directly and create a photon. And it's not really momentum, rather it's, it's again, K-space, but just bear with me for, the, for, the for this. And the probability of having an electron being able to use phonons or other vibrations of the silicon to change, you know, the vibrations of the silicon, which are phonons, to change its momentum and have the same momentum line up with the hole is very improbable. So when you have an indirect band gap material, what happens is the recombination occurs, but it all goes into heat. You don't get a photon like you do in a direct band gap material. Again, don't get too hung up on this concept. The main thing I want you to remember is that direct band gap semiconductors emit photons when they recombine if it's a high quality semiconductor and indirect band gap materials do not. Examples of direct band gap are gallium arsenide, gallium nitrate, and the phosphide. Indirect materials are silicon, germanium, silicon carbide, meaning that you're not going to make a light emitting diode out of these. So if you want to make LEDs or lasers, which we talk about later, they're all made out of materials like this. There's no such thing yet as a, as a silicon or germanium laser that's made out of regular old silicon because it simply can't emit light. So at that point, um, you can do these review questions and come prepared. Um, and then after that, you can um, go on to the next portion of this, uh, of this second lecture.